All right, look at the Genesis 1 account, which is going to be compared to the Genesis 2 account, the creation of man. Man in the sense of mankind, male and female, is created in God's image. We left off. Let's see what we view here a little bit. Talking about created out of nothing or created out of something. Later in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, we have the creation of the woman. God used the side of Adam, which he took from Adam to make the woman. So he's creating out of existing materials. It's not out of nothing. So the word made in Genesis 2.22, made he a woman, is the Hebrew word transliterated as bana. It means to build or to construct from existing materials, as opposed to the word Hebrew word bara, which means to create out of nothing. But then all of a sudden, we have So God created, out of nothing, man in his own image. Uh-oh. Now that's a different create of substances that are already existing. He formed. Now it's bara, create of nothing. Is there a conflict here? No, the, the physical body was formed out of existing materials, but it had no life and had no image of God. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And he created them, it states, and Jehovah God forms Yatsar, the man, from dust from the ground and breathes into his nostrils breath of life. Two things. From the dust of the ground, the, the, all the components of man, men, woman, are created. <clears throat> now, the, given the lives, the breath of lives, plural, the Hebrew Hayam, masculine plural, two lives in one living being existing together, man's soul and his human spirit, and the man becomes a living creature. He wasn't alive before, but he was. God formed a body from the elements and compounds already made, described as dust of the ground, and then breathed into the body man's essence, his soul and spirit, out of nothing. But the, the body itself was created from existing materials, formed. So if you want to focus on Genesis 1 and 2 and the differences, you have to read it properly. And even in Genesis 2, there's a potential conflict if you start cherry-picking verses and then uh, editorializing the meaning. <clears throat> so let's look at where we left off. So, page 85 by Henry Morris. Henry Morris states in his work, page 83, in this section, chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, the most distinctive vocabulary difference is the use of the divine name Lord, God, Yahweh Elohim. Two names instead of God, Elohim, in chapter 1. Does that mean the author is a, another author? Or is, can, I get, can I refer to my father as dad, a father, or um, Walter? Depends. In Genesis 4, same person, two, two three different ways of referring. In Genesis 4, However, Lord, Yahweh, is used almost exclusively. The name God occurs in 425. The different names for God were used in order to portray the absolute sovereignty of God in creating the heavens and the earth. That's Elohim, chapter 1, Elohim. And the ongoing detail that a personal Yahweh, yet almighty God, was involved with in his creation, chapter 2, Yahweh, Elohim, the two words together, Lord God. And then the personal involvement that Yahweh maintained in an ongoing manner with his creation, especially man, chapter 4, Yahweh. You refer to your mother as mom, and a mother, or uh, Virginia, Virginia Evans, when you're refer, introducing. So people have multiple ways by which they're referred to. So don't tell me they're different authors. I'm a different son when I say mom versus mother versus Virginia Waters or Virginia Evans. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Genesis are alleged by many commentators to be two contradictory accounts of creation. According to the first account, man and woman were created together as the crown and climax of creation <clears throat> after the birds and mammal animals, whereas they allege that according to chapter 2, the creation of man is preceded by the creation of all the animals and birds while the creation of woman followed their creation 
but there is no contradiction in the order of creation between Genesis chapters 1 and 2 actually. Chapter 2 provides more detail, but it does not contradict chapter 1. <clears throat> we already went over that about God creating samples or individual uh, pieces or uh, forms of the animals and the birds for Adam to name, specific selected ones. He didn't have them line up into the Garden of Eden and uh, have Adam name them that way. He didn't have to do that. He's God. He just created, okay, what do you think of this one? Name this one. And name that one. He just created them. He created them out of nothing, created more out of nothing. So, <clears throat> so in Genesis 2, 8 to 9, Jehovah God planted a garden in East Eden, set Adam in it, caused every tree that is beautiful or good for, for food to grow there. See, he created vegetation throughout the whole world on a particular day of creation. And then he created some more particular ones for the Garden of Eden and planted in the midst of the garden the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is not another author's work. He's focusing in on what he did in that particular garden scenario, thereby creating additional, did you have it? get it, additional vegetation after Adam was formed. He didn't stop creating things until day seven. This is not day seven. Don't editorialize, just read. But there is no implication in Genesis that God would be through creating vegetation by the end of day three. <clears throat> so we look at Genesis 2 8, and Jehovah God was, was planting, in perfect mood, a garden in Eden at the east, and he was setting in perfect mood again, an ongoing creation of whatever he decided to create at the moment. There the man, and he was, and he was setting in perfect mood, there the man whom he had formed, perfect mood, had formed. See, now there's a, a done deal. And Jehovah God was causing in perfect mood to sprout from the ground every tree desirable for appearance and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> don't read into this. Just read from it. If you don't know anything about moods and tenses and when the verbs create a certain action that's ongoing, or it's done, a done deal, well then get yourself an interlinear. I've got one, look, just take a look at it. And don't invent your own understanding of the verbs or the moods. Genesis 2.8. I'm not lying, folks. Genesis 2.8 and 9, let's just take a look at it. Now if you had this interlinear, it's, uh, there are other, others available. I just happen to like this one. It's format better. I'm used to it. But there are others that are just as good. All right, let's wait till it opens up completely, splits into four screens. Magic. I like the way you can do it with this one, too. Now I just go and click on Study. Now I want to know, what does the Hebrew look like? So let's just go over and select Genesis 2.8, 2, and 8 and 9. <clears throat> he planted. Now we looked at Genesis 2.8. And Jehovah God was planting perfect, imperfect mood, a garden in Eden at the east. Genesis 2.8. And he planted Yahweh God, Lord God, Jehovah God. And he planted Yahweh God. And guess what? It's imperfect. It's ongoing. So he, and he planted, and he was planting. Okay, so it's ongoing. So that's not a good translation. Let's just correct that, let's see, and see what the versions have to say in Genesis 2.8. NASB, what does it say? The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. The Young's literal. And there it is, and Jehovah God, literal, Young's literal, was written in uh, ancient, or uh, in old English, planted. <clears throat> That's an ongoing Activity and God and Jehovah God planted plants in modern English a garden in Eden so it's ongoing imperfect at the east and he set setteth there the man that's he did it one time that's a past tense in English the man whom he had formed hath formed past tense so he takes the man that he had formed in in, in a recent past and as the the Lord God plants a plant garden in Eden. He sets him in that garden. And Jehovah God caused to sprout from the, the ground. He 
cause it. That's present, ongoing, and perfect mood. Let's see what New King James Version says. The Lord planted a garden. See, it's not ex exactly that accurate, so you have to look at the tenses. Planted, King James Version. The Lord got planted, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Because he's continually planting things while Adam is placed in there. I, almost like Adam is, is said, okay, watch me, God says to Adam. And he's planting stuff in the garden for him. Planted. And now the Lord had planted. See, that's not the right mood. So I like the Young's literal translation. I look at that all the time to see. It, it doesn't care how accurate it is in English. It goes literally what the tenses say. And sometimes people don't like that because it's not as accurate as English as you'd like. But we're not looking at accurate English. We're looking at accurate Hebrew. And then saying what the author wrote, what he intended to write was an ongoing. So we just take a look at the complete biblical library. It's imperfect. It's ongoing. And look at this. And he put imperfect there. It's ongoing. He's placing him there, which he had formed. There's the past tense, past mood rather here. Eight, which he had I lost the, I made it bigger there's the perfect mood so that's a done deal so he's ongoingly pan, planting these this vegetation that's beautiful for the garden and the tree of knowledge good and evil and, and so on while the man is standing there that he planted I guess I beat that to death so <clears throat> Chapter 2, beginning with 2.4b, In the day that the Lord God made earth and the heavens, revisits the six days of creation, beginning at the third day at the time when all the shrubs of the field, they were not yet in the sense of grown on the earth, and all the plants of the field were not yet sprouted. The text in chapter 2 goes on to indicate that there was no man yet to work the ground, nor rain, but there was a mist which came up from the ground, evidently from an underground source. This corresponds to the time frame of Genesis 1, 9 to 10, just before vegetation appeared on the earth. Now we go back. We're upon the focus of chapter 2. It's not the same as chapter 1. Chapter 2 goes into specifics, panning in on the panoramic, panorama viewpoint of Genesis chapter 1, whereupon the focus of chapter 2 jumps forward in time past the remainder of day three of creation, past the time when God had the earth bring forth grasses, herbs, and trees, Genesis 1 to 11 to 13. Note that there is no stipulation or implication in Genesis 1, 11 to 13 that God was finished with bringing forth grasses, herbs, and trees, as some contend. Reading into it instead of from it, it would be on day number seven that Jehovah God would rest in the sense of ceasing his creation work. So just take a look, Genesis 1, 11 to 13 does not contradict Genesis chapter 2. He's not finished. Then God, Elohim, said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. As he finished creating this grass and herbs? No, not till day seven. Can he go ahead and create a little garden over there and do something special in there? No, 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 no. no it doesn't say he stopped. So, Genesis 1, 13. So the evening and the morning were the third day. For God did form more vegetation on day six of creation in the Garden of Eden, which he created after he had formed the man Adam. He's, you know, Don't try to put your own order of things. Don't be an editor. Read from it. The key Hebrew word of Genesis 2.9, transliterated, which means causes to grow, is in the imperfect tense portraying indefinite action. Even the translations, only one got it right, the Young's literal translation, as we looked at. So it is best translated, was causing to grow, corroborating the conclusion of the sprouting of vegetation on the sixth day of creation after Adam had been formed. 
So, that's the Hebrew... Per